Well, good evening to everybody, both those who are here in the sanctuary with us, as well as those joining us on YouTube or on Facebook Live. We're so grateful to have you in uh, with us this evening, if you would. Grab your Bibles. Let's go to Malachi chapter 2 this evening as we continue our study on uh, returning to God and, and what it means. The, the chapter 2 really kind of sets up a contrast between a God-centered servant and a selfish servant. So tonight we want to look specifically at what is going on here in chapter 2. Uh, what were the priests doing? What was it leading to? And ultimately, what did God promise to do as a result of this? Now, we know that the text is primarily aimed at the priests because of how chapter 2 opens. It says, O ye priests, this commandment is for you. This was God saying, you better listen up. Okay, so let's look at it together. I'm going to begin in verse 8. And it says this, but ye are departed out of the way. Ye have caused many to stumble at the law. Ye have corrupted the covenant of Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore have I also made you contemptible and base before all the people, according as ye have not kept my ways, but have been partial in the law. Have we not all one father? Hath not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously every man against his brother? By profaning the covenant of our fathers. Judah hath dealt treacherously, and an abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah hath profaned the holiness of the Lord, which he loved, and hath married the daughter of a strange God. Would you pray with me? Father, we praise you for tonight. We thank you for this opportunity just to study your word. And God, we ask uh, that your Holy Spirit would guide us into the truth. Lord, reveal not only the truth of the text, but also the truth of who we are and where we stand with you. And Lord God, if there's any sin found in us, may we confess it and turn from it this evening. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we begin to look at, and we're really going to cover the first 11 uh, verses uh, here in the text. But we want to talk about, first off, uh, two ways that the priest failed. All right, so the first one is this. They disobeyed the Lord. We see that opening phrase in verse 8. But ye have departed out of the way. Uh, th this is, they have left the right beliefs and right practices. Now again, we have to remember that as priests, they were given an incredible privilege of representing God to the people. And this covenant that God had made with his people was to give them life and to give them peace, according to verse 5. But the priests were teaching the way they wanted to. They were teaching what they wanted to do. So instead of drawing people closer to God, they were actually pushing people further from God. You know, a similar situation happened in Jesus' day with the Pharisees, and it led to something very interesting that Jesus says. It's found in Matthew 23, and it's verses 1 to 3. It says this, Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say... And do not. Notice, Jesus says, listen to them. Do what they say do because it's right, but don't follow their example. Now, they were listening because the Pharisees, they were sitting in Moses' seat. That was the seat of authority. Okay? This is the teacher who is teaching them about who God is. And what God expects. But Jesus says, don't do what they do. Can you think of a, of a stronger condemnation than for somebody to go, yeah, listen to what he says, but don't do what he does. It makes me think of James 3, 1. It says, my brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. This is a text talking about teachers. It says, but don't, don't strive to be a teacher because you're going to receive the greater, the stricter judgment. 
For the believer, it's vital that you are very careful about who you allow to influence you, especially when it comes to biblical teaching. The reality is very few false teachers just come right out and go, hey, here's a false doctrine. No, what they do is they slip in just enough truth to confuse their hearers. Like, well, that was right, and that was right, that was right, that was right, so maybe that's right. This is why Jesus says that they are wolves in sheep's clothing. They look the part, but they have no part. Now, how can you and I make sure that we don't fall victim to a false teacher? Well, God has given us two guards against it. The first one is the Spirit of God. The second is the Word of God. You need to pray that the Spirit will reveal the truth about a pastor or a teacher. You need to pray that God would give you discernment on what you're hearing. But the biggest thing that you need to learn to do is to have an open Bible. When you are in a sanctuary, when you are watching online, whatever you're doing, when you are in the Word of God, you need to have an open Bible so that you can match what you're hearing with what God has actually said. So not only were they disobeying the Lord, but the second thing that the priests were doing is they distracted the people. That next phrase there says, Ye have caused many to stumble at the law. Throughout the Bible, the, there are harsh words given as a warning to those who would falsely teach God's people. But the strongest warning comes from Jesus' lips himself. Mark chapter 9, verses 42 and 43, it says, And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and he were cast into the sea. And if I hand offend thee, cut it off. It's better thee that to enter into the life maimed than having two hands to go into hell into the fire that never shall be quenched. Now, backing up to verse 42 here, when it talks about these little ones, it's not talking about little children. Okay, a lot of people say, oh, oh that's little children. No, no. This is talking about those who are new in the faith. Okay, the spiritually immature. And so, this text really kind of came alive in a special way a couple of weeks ago. Uh, on my day off, Diane and I took a trip down to Mabry Mill. And uh, I, I don't know if you've ever seen a millstone, uh, but there at Mabry Mill, they have one. So I, I, we took a picture of it. I, I want you to see it. All right? This is a picture of a millstone that would have been used, you know, really colonial times up, up Civil War and stuff. So kind of gives you an idea, right? Now, look at how thick this thing and big this thing is. Okay, they would weigh anywhere from 300 pounds all the way up to a couple of thousand pounds. Or so, I mean, a millstone could actually be up to about a ton. So Jesus says, it would be better if a millstone was hung around your neck than to mislead one of my children. So literally, here's where Jesus is going. It would be better if you were dead than to lead somebody astray. That's what Jesus is saying. That is how important it is that you and I as teachers take the word of God. It's why we should spend all week prepping and preparing a lesson and not doing a Saturday night special. Now listen, sometimes life happens. You don't get to put in as much time as you should. I understand it. I've been there. But we ought to do everything that we can to make sure that we are prepared to stand before the people of God. Okay, because before we talk to people about God, we, we need to make sure that we've talked to God about people. All right, we need to hear from God, and then we need to go speak the word of God. It takes us back to James 3.1 about that greater judgment, that stricter judgment that will come on those who teach the word of God. And by the way, as evidence in the text, the, the misleading isn't just in what you say. It is also in how you live. Now remember, you are an ambassador, Paul says. 
So, no, you may not be formally teaching like I do or like other Bible uh, teachers, uh, uh, pastors do. But you are teaching. Every word that comes out of our mouth, every action we take is teaching something about God. Or it is leading people away from God. And so we just need to, we need to wrap our minds around that. We need to understand that. Now, what was the result? What, what was happening to the, the people? Well, they didn't listen. There in verse 9, part of God's judgment on the priests for the way they were living and teaching is that the people weren't going to listen to them. They weren't going to respect them. The, peace, the, the priests were despised, and in a way, they were humiliated by the people's contempt for them. Now, let me ask you, are we seeing this today? I would say, yeah. It wasn't that many years ago that pastors were, were respected people, not only in the church, but even in the community. People wanted to know, what does the man of God think and believe about this particular situation? And that's not really the case. There are so many scandals within ministry. Pastors are really some of the least respected people in the community. Now, a lot of times pastors will go, oh, we're persecuted, or, or look at how secular our society is, has become. But I really think that myself and my fellow pastors, we need to look ourselves in the mirror. And we need to understand that we have brought a lot of this on ourselves. That before we ever ask our people to repent, we must repent first. But I think it's also important that all Christians examine their life to make sure that it's not a blatant contradiction between our talk and our walk. To make sure that we are actually loving God and loving others and, and pointing them towards Him. There are uh, three texts, there's a lot more, but three texts I want us to to see Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24, David says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Now when he says, know my heart, he, he's not really saying, hey, I want you to know it because God's all-knowing. So what I want you to think about and put in that word right there is, Search me, O God, and reveal my heart. Try me, reveal my thoughts. Now, now, why is David saying that? Because you and I are great at lying to ourselves. And David's going, I don't want hypocrisy in my life anymore. And so, God, I want you to search me. Every inch of my life, I want you to search me. And I want you to reveal the truth about me. See if there'd be any wicked way in me. Sometimes there's known sin, and sometimes there's subtle sin. And David goes, I want you to reveal it to me. Why? Because I want you to lead me in the way everlasting. I want you to lead me in your way, God. I want to live in such a way that glorifies you. Paul writes about it uh, when we talk about the taking of the Lord's Supper. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty eight. 28 says, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. He's been talking about taking an unworthy manner. And Paul says, you need to examine yourself and make sure that you're going to take this in, in a worthy manner. Finally, there's what Peter wrote in 1 Peter 3, uh, verse 16. Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. Peter's going, listen, when people are trying to discredit you, and, and call you names and evildoers and, and all of that, don't give them any ammunition. Let their accusations be so off base that people won't even listen to them like that. I know that guy. That's not him. So let me ask you a question. Is there any glaring contradiction in your life right now? See, while this is about us, it's about something bigger as well. See, you and I, remember, we're missionaries, we're priests, we're ambassadors. We represent God. Therefore, when people listen to us and they see how we live, we're painting for them a picture of who God is and what he's like. And so you and I need to remember that sin in our lives defiles us, damages the testimony of the church, the gospel, and ultimately God to those that we are trying 
to reach. Your sin isn't just about you. It's about your relationship with God. It's about your relationship within the church. And it's about your witness to those in the community. This is another reason that you and I need uh, accountability relationships in our lives. We want to reflect the glory and the grace of God to those around us. We want to live in such a way that people see something different in us that they don't see in themselves or in other people around them. And if we don't have somebody holding us accountable, that's not going to happen. Not only did they not respect them or listen to them, but they followed their example. We see there in verse 10 and 11, there's a phrase that says, dealt treacherously. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this tonight because it's where we're going to go, uh, Lord willing, on uh, Sunday. But to deal treacherously is a phrase that means they were breaking covenant with God. Okay, now there in verse 11, it, it opens by saying Judah. This was more than the priesthood. This was the entire nation of Israel. The conduct of the priest was harming and leading astray the people of Israel. So you and I have to, again, we've got to remember that our conduct isn't just about us. So let's ask the third question. What did God do as a result? Well, three things uh, in the text. The first one is he threatened to cut them off. Back there in verse 1 when he, he says this commandment is for you. This is God saying if you don't listen to me, there are going to be consequences. All right, think of it as a parent going to the child and saying, listen, I'm not going to tell you this again. You need to do this. This is what God is saying. He's going, you need to get this right, and you need to get it right now. Or I'm going to deal with you. It's actually a similar warning that God gave to the city and the people of Nineveh. In Nahum 1.14 it says, And the Lord hath given a commandment concerning thee, that no more of thy name be sown. Out of the house of thy gods will I cut off the graven image and the molten image. I will make thy grave, for thou art vile. Now, the fact that this warning in Malachi is similar to the one here in Nahum is showing that God is saying that the priests are behaving as ungodly as the wicked nations around them. He was threatening to deal with them, not as his children, but rather as his enemies. And so this, once again, reminds us of the necessity of obedience. One thing that, if you were to read all of Scripture, but especially the Old Testament, one thing that should become crystal clear to you is the holiness of God and his absolute hatred of sin. Paul actually gives a, a similar warning to the Gentile Christians in, in Romans 11, 16 to 21. He, he writes this, For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are, are the branches. He's talking about Israel. And some of the branches be broken off, and thou, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. In other words, uh, God is grafting the Gentiles. He's making them part of that same family, that family of God as Israel. Okay, Boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. Paul saying, if God would discipline and cut off his chosen nation, don't you think for a second that God won't reject you if you don't live in obedience and give evidence of your salvation? See, Israel thought they were God's children because they were Israel. Just like some people think they're Christian because they go to church. 
And God goes, you're not mine unless you bear fruit that proves the root. So God threatens to cut them off. Second thing God does as a result is he curses them in verse 2. Notice God says, not only am I going to do it, but I've already started. Again, part of God's judgment against the priests is how they were viewed scornfully by the people. But part of God's judgment was also going to come later. We see there in verse 3, it says, Behold, I will corrupt your seed and spread dung upon your face, even the dung of your solemn feast, and one shall take you away with it. Now, that, that deals with where the sacrifices were made. They were outside of the city, okay, and the refuse, and all of that was outside of the city. Only the, the sacrifice and the blood was brought in. But God is going, you have been defiling me within, I'm going to defile you without. Okay? But talking about that, that seed right there in verse 3, there are really two possible meanings for it. Um, the first one would be a reference to their crops, the, the harvest. Uh, if you were to study the law, you would see that the priests were not given an inheritance. Uh, they weren't given a portion of land as an inheritance when the promised land was being divided up and the reason is given in Deuteronomy 10 9 it says wherefore a Levi hath no part nor inheritance with his brethren the Lord is his inheritance according as the Lord thy God promised him the priests were to rely on God to provide everything they needed now the way that God did that was he commanded the people to give them ten, the Levites 10 percent of their crops okay now we, we see in Malachi chapter 3 that the people weren't doing that. It's why God says that my storehouses are empty. He wasn't just talking about money wasn't being given. He was also talking about how the crops and the grain, the things that the Levites would need to live on, that wasn't being brought in either because of the way the, Levites, uh, the priests were living and the way that they were teaching. So the priests were being judged and that the people they were leading astray, they weren't providing for them. Instead of teaching the whole counsel of God and, and trusting God and being provided for, they were perverting God's word. Now, the second meaning of seed actually could be a reference to their children. Uh, there were two stigmas in this day. The first one is if you didn't have any children. Okay, um, That was seen as a judgment uh, by God against you. The second stigma would be if you had children who were disobedient to you and to the Lord. And really that was seen as worse than not having any children at all. Uh, we see an example of this with Eli the priest there in uh, Samuel's. Um, he had two sons, Eli and or Hophni and Phinehas. Okay, and they were as corrupt as they come. And Eli was scorned because of it, and God actually ripped the priesthood away from him because of it. Okay? We can also read in the law how God is jealous for his name, and he says, I will visit the iniquity of the fathers upon the third and fourth generation. Now, this isn't God saying that he's going to punish the children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren for the father's sin. Rather, what he's saying is what the father struggled with, the kids are also going to struggle with. It, it really reminds me of a uh, quote from Jonathan Falwell. It says, what one generation tolerates, the next will celebrate. Think of how we're seeing that right now. What one generation tolerates the next will celebrate now here's the really difficult part about it although israel was suffering they refused to repent their questions to god were really denials of what god says they were guilty of here in the in the book of malachi when he says you're doing this and go well well how is that possible they're, they're going no we're not doing this it's kind of like when a parent comes up to a child and goes, all right, who did this? And all the kids go, uh, not me. Uh, yeah, I've always said the two most popular people in our house are somebody and nobody. Somebody did it and nobody knows who did. 
But I've always tried to tell my kids, listen, if I come and ask you a question, I'm not asking because I don't know. I'm asking because I'm giving you a chance to come clean. That's exactly what God's doing with Israel. And they're still deny, 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 deny. See, they weren't putting together the correlation between their sinfulness and their situation. They, they didn't see that their sin was causing them to be where they were and experiencing what was happening. Again, we see this today. And we're going to continue to see it. We can go into the book of Revelation and we can see that as God was pouring out, his, as God will pour out his judgment on the earth. The, the people curse God, but they refuse to repent. There has to be some other explanation for this, they think. But here's where we're going to end, and here's the, the glimmer of hope that we have. God also promised to send a redeemer. And verse 7 is the first introduction of the phrase, messenger of the Lord. We're going to see it as we get into Malachi chapter 3, uh, maybe in a couple of weeks. As bad as the current priesthood was, God was not going to abandon his people. Why? Because he is faithful. He is faithful to his promises and in keeping his covenant. The messenger was going to do what the current priests wouldn't do. There is this greater priesthood. We see it, you could read it in Hebrews 7, 11 to 28. I'm only going to read a few of those verses. 11 to 14 says, If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? All right, so the writer of Hebrews goes, If we could be saved by the law, then why would there need to be another high priest come who is different than previous high priests? Verse 12, for the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. In other words, the, the fact that there is another priesthood coming means that the law was never intended to save but to reveal our sinfulness. Verse 13, for he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe, of which no man gave attendance at the altar. This priest that's coming after the order of Melchizedek is not a Levite. Verse 14. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. So the high priesthood that is established in Hebrews 4, uh, under Jesus, under the order, uh, after the order of Melchizedek, is altogether different than the priesthood that began in Moses' day and is here in Malachi. And that's because the Levitical priesthood was always meant to be temporary until the high priest came and made the final and full sacrifice for sins. That eternal high priest, of course, is Jesus. This is the contrast that Malachi makes in chapter 2. The current priesthood full of sin and hypocrisy versus the eternal sinless priesthood of Jesus. That if we could be saved by the law, then Jesus didn't have to come. He didn't have to suffer. He didn't have to die. And he didn't have to rise again. But the very fact that Jesus did those things is evidence that you and I cannot save ourselves. Everything that we need is provided in the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Again, we cannot be saved by our works. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And praise and glory be to God, our Father. That what you and I cannot do, Jesus has done perfectly so that we could receive what we don't deserve. That's what Malachi 2 is showing us. A God-centered servant whose name is Jesus. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this evening and this opportunity to study your word. God, I pray that I've been faithful to the text. I pray that we have been challenged to think about how we are talking and how we are living. And Father, reveal to us if there's any sin in us. 
that we might confess it and forsake it. Be with us as we go to our homes, we pray in Jesus' name, amen, and good night.